Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Dr. Jody Skillicorn is board certified in psychiatry and neurology and a diplomat of the American Board of Holistic Integrative Medicine. Dr. Skillicorn is the author of the book, Healing Depression Without Medications, subtitled, A Psychiatrist's Guide to Balancing Mind, Body, and Soul. Well, Dr. Jody, thank you so much for coming back and talking with us again. How have you, how have you been the past couple of weeks? Oh, it's good. Summer, it's, we've just been hanging out and playing and working. And working. Well, well, I invited you back again this time to talk a little bit more about the practical tools you use with people when they come to, uh, to ask you for help. And um, so what you'd start with and the order in which you would introduce them, we've already talked about things like uh, the breath work and the emotional freedom technique tapping, which I, I tell people, this is like a way to give yourself an acupressure treatment for anything that bothers you physically, mentally, or emotionally. Yeah. Uh, and there are, are other things that you mention in your toolkit. So um, can you give us an example of how you begin to work with somebody who comes to you for one of the more common um, complaints? I, I would imagine that would be the anxiety and the depression and the focus. Yeah. So I, for, for those things, I almost always start with the breath. And so I usually start by um, – so, so often people come in with an idea of what breath work is, and I'll often have them show me. If they, they say, oh, I breathe all the time, I take deep breaths, and they'll, they'll uh, take a deep breath, and like their shoulders will be up to their ears, and they're like gripping their whole body, and everything's tight and tense. Um, so then we kind of work with breathing more into the belly, and, and, and I explain using the Dan Siegel hand model. Are you familiar with that? How, why the breath is so important. So, so just briefly for our listeners, yeah. describe the Dan Single hand model. Yeah, so if you imagine taking your fist and if you put your thumb, kind of fold your thumb across and drape the four fingers over the thumb, so the thumb's in the middle. And then if you look at your own hand and imagine that's half the brain, um, your forearm is the, is the spinal cord. And then when you come up to where it meets the wrist, that would be the brain stem. So, so that ancient part of the brain that's in charge of the um, breathing and the heart rate. And then you come to the middle and that's the limbic system. So that's where your thumb is. And the limbic system, that's our threat detector. That's where our fight, flight, flee, freeze response starts from. And then over that is the frontal lobe. So the four fingers over, and that's the part of the brain that's involved in thinking and planning and, um, and um, contemplation and, and doing all those kind of things. And the part of the brain that ruminates and gets caught up in all those stories that we're worried about all the time. Um, so it's sort of a blessing and a curse. But what I always explain to people, right, is when we get stressed, what happens is the limbic system, that part in the middle, the thumb, takes over, and the frontal lobes literally get hijacked, right? 80% of the blood from the frontal lobes, drains to other parts of the body so it can prepare to fight, to flee, to freeze. Um, and so we can't just talk to that limbic system, right? It's pre-verbal. We can't just have a communication be like, everything's okay, everything's okay. We're just sitting on a couch, everything's okay. Um, but what we can do is start to breathe into the belly. And when we do that, that activates a nerve, the vagal nerve, which winds up and comes to the brain stem and the limbic system and tells it, everything's okay. And so it allows it to shift, basically put the brakes on so that whole system can slow down and settle and let the body know that actually in this moment, uh, we may, there may be things we're worried about in the future, but in this moment, we're, we're, we're safe. safe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then it's just some people, however, lots of people don't breathe into their belly at all. It's totally into the chest. And so part of it is just teaching people to breathe deeper into the belly and not trying to force it, but sometimes just by putting your hands over the belly 
um, and just starting to notice whatever little movement there is, just by bringing our focus there, it starts to fill just a little bit more. And one of the things I tell people is in a, in a much simpler explanation than Dr. Siegel's model is, if I can get myself to take a long, slow, deep breath, hold it for a couple counts at the top, and then resist the exhale, so my exhale is two to four to eight times longer than the inhale, that's what sends the message to the body and the vagus nerve that this is not fight or flight. Because if there is an actual physical threat, my body won't let me breathe like that. Right, it, right. It, it will have me doing an action to try and protect myself or run or whatever. <clears throat> you know, there are so many different breathing techniques out there. There are yoga techniques, there are meditation mm -hmm. techniques, there's in one side, out the other side. There's all of these four count, you know, the four, seven, eight count. Um, so what do you recommend? Is there anything specific or just what you said, this idea of, of getting the conscious logical mind to focus on what happens when you take a breath what is it that you use specifically with your patients? So where I start is actually working with their breath in the moment. So first noticing it as it is, right? So I find a lot of the yoga breathing, um, it's, it's sort of too advanced in a way, right? It's requiring too long of a breath. And it, with people that are anxious, the breath tends to be really shallow. Most of the people I see, their breath count is maybe one or two. So to have them breathing in for a count of seven or eight or longer, it, it isn't going to happen. It creates a lot of stress. So I start by just having them notice their breath in this moment. So if they're breathing more in the chest or in the belly, and then I start to have them become aware of um, the inhalation as compared to the exhalation, because what you usually find is one is going to be more restricted than the other. And just by paying attention to that, you start to notice, it starts to relax a little bit. And then noticing the count of their own breath. So like I said, most of the people I see, it's usually a count of one or two. A healthy breath though, you know, we want five, six, seven, longer counts. Um, and so it's, it's just, but it's starting where they're at, just like everything else. So you start where they're at and then, I slowly have them slowly just build just a little bit, if that makes sense. So yeah, if it's a count I, of two, then maybe I would do a sort of a box breath. So breathing in for a count of two, holding for a count of two, breathing out for a count of two, pausing for a count of two, to kind of break the habit of the breath. And then start to slowly increase that. And then you mentioned for some patients, um, you have to include movement with the breath. Yeah, so then I like to do things sort of more qigong, so sort of um, sort of raising the arms with the breath, so just allowing, so it's, some people don't like, it's hard to sit still, so just adding some movement in, some gentle movements with the breath, but they also help expand the breath as you're doing it. And do you have them sit or stand to do that? It could be either. I mean, you could just, even sitting here right now, if you just take a deep breath in and raise your arms, and then raising it out as you lower your arms. Um, so usually I have people stand, but if you know someone can't, then we would just do it seated. So then what if you have someone and, and they're, they're following along and they're willing to breathe and, and they get a little bit more relaxed and they notice that, what do you do next? to notice that just by shifting their breathing, to become aware of what's going on in their body as it's shifting. Um, so if they start to become relaxed, you recognize that just, you know, often a couple of minutes of breathing, even a few seconds for some people can shift dramatically the state they came into the room in. So really just awareness of what's going on in this moment. So you're trying to build their sense of agency or actual control over their emotional state and physical state? Absolutely, yeah. What's next? Uh, so what's next is really depends on what they're coming in for. So often, um, so that's one of the primary tools I teach. Um, EFT is another primary tool I teach um, so that they um, 
again, sometimes of just sitting and breathing, if we're so agitated, we're already kind of past, we can't get ourselves to do that. That's where the tapping um, can be really useful because it can get you to that place where you can start to breathe a little more easily. Um, so with the tapping, I explained to people, right, sort of the idea of acupuncture and acupressure and these energy channels running through the body and how each one has a different role in our physiology and our emotions and charge of different organ systems. Um, and by tapping on them, we can start to balance those energy systems, and balance the body. Um, so then I'll teach them the, the tapping so as do another you, option. Do you have handouts used for that? Is there a website you direct them to? I know there's a lot of stuff available free on the internet about EFT. The yeah, the so I often, well, I have a handout I give them, but I also do um, like emofree.com and um, there's a bunch of there's, there's a bunch of them out there now that are quite good and have lots and lots of free information on even how to just teach the basics I usually teach it during the session but I always refer them to those places so they can and YouTube, have it if they need it in the moment and YouTube um, has been a real good source for a lot of people put mm -hmm. out some nice videos it just you can watch somebody talking you through it and tapping on themselves or tapping on somebody else. And that's one of the resources I like to give people because mm -hmm. they don't have to go sign up, pay money. Yeah. And it's, it's one of the more powerful tools I've encountered over the years. Yeah. Do you do much actual EFT tapping with patients in sessions? Yeah, I, I tend to do more of the EMDR, but I do do a lot of the tapping depending on what. But as things come up, we just work with whatever's coming up as it comes up. So if they're in a um, state of panic or fear, and as is really common right now, or around so much fear around the COVID and different situations, um, right? We'll just start tapping through and calming the body around that. Um, but I also, so EMDR, I often, in the session, I often have people holding the, 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 the little vibrators um, in the session, even as they're just telling whatever's just, just, you know, bothering them in the moment, just helping them, again, settle the nervous system, even if we're not like, formally doing the EMDR. Yeah, that's like the, uh, reminds me of um, years ago when Gary Craig was kind of, um, taking a break, having created EFT. And it caught on in um, Australia. And they had a, a, a series of, um, they called it tapping down under. <laughs> and one of the things they would do is they, they, they took out the, the first part of the tapping that Gary Craig called the setup and they didn't do the setup, the, uh, uh, even though I have this problem, I love and accept myself, whatever. They would just start tapping on all the energy points while they talked. So they'd have somebody come in and talk about their week or the session or whatever problem, and they would be doing the tapping mm -hmm. nonstop as they talked through the session. And just like you're using the EMDR vibrations left to right while the people were talking, um, they call it continuous tapping, and they call it a variety of other things, but mm -hmm. they found it was very effective and far more than just a distraction technique. Yeah, yeah. The other one I do often, especially now because I'm working completely virtually, is um, just to have people tap back and forth on their own arms, just a butterfly hug, so just crossing right. the arms and tapping at whatever speed feels soothing. Um, but again, regardless... You, you know, just whatever they're talking about that's bothering you, it just helps settle and, and, and integrate, I think. Because again, right. you're in the back and I, forth. I love yeah. that word, integrate. It, it helps them have awareness of more than just the thoughts racing in the frontal lobes. Right, right. And sending a signal while the story may be activating and, and, and um, charging the sympathetic nervous system, right? You're getting a different message through the body. Well, your use of the word story triggered me to think about how Brene Brown talks about um, a little tool, little tool that saved her marriage a number of times. And that tool is the phrase, 
the story I'm telling myself now is, mm-hmm. and, and she shared in an article how she and her husband have used that. He came home one day and said, uh, did you have something planned for dinner? And she immediately went into all of the negative thoughts. Oh, just because I'm the woman, I have to take care of all the food. And I, but because they've practiced this, she caught herself getting all tight and tense and triggered. And she took a breath and she said, okay, the story I'm telling myself now is you think it's all my responsibility just because I'm the woman and blah, blah, blah. And then she took a breath and he said, okay, well, thanks for letting me know that. He said, the reason I asked is because on the way home from work, I stopped and picked up makings for lasagna. And if you didn't have anything planned, I was going to make the lasagna. But if you had something else planned for today, I can make it another day. Yeah, such a perfect example. Right. The whole situation just diffused. Well, I've had people tell me, because I've shared that with a number of people over the years since I heard that from Brene Brown's article. I've had them tell me they use that in their own thought process. They'll do the butterfly hug and they'll say, okay, the story I'm telling myself now is it's all doom and gloom. It'll never get better. I'm going to be a failure the rest of my life. And just verbalizing it clearly, if they can't, we often recommend people will write it down, journal it, because when you put it out on paper, sometimes the absurdity of what the thought is gets more clear when you write it out. Yes. But that, Doing the butterfly hug and just using that phrase, okay, what's the story I'm telling myself right now? The story I'm telling myself now is, and that can interrupt the nonstop loop of negativity that we've become so accustomed to. Yeah, it gives it just that little bit of space. Right, right. Yeah, and then I use the word story all the time with my patients, and sometimes I get very, very upset, but it's not a story, it's real. But, but the meaning we're attaching to whatever the event is, is the story. Exactly. Right, so there's right. the event, and then there's how we're interpreting it, how we're judging it, whether we're defining it as good or bad or wrong or right, or right, that, that all amps everything yeah. up. Hopeless or hopeful, you know, that's yeah. my story. Right. The events are actual. <laughs> Right. The adventure, actually. And, and that idea about first recognizing and then making use of that space, right? The little bit of space between the thought and the emotion. Yes. And um, James Pupura in his book, Perception, Seeing is Not Believing, makes use of that very, very um, strongly. He talks about how if you can just start to recognize the rush of emotions. And right before that, there was this pause where your thoughts said, hey, look, this is what this means. And then there is the, and a lot of people have said, that's part of why it's so useful to get into the habit of breathing, to bring my attention to my breath, because then, It gives you that space. Well, and then I can recognize, hey, my breathing has changed. And then I can just take a breath and say, what's going on with my breathing? That can interrupt that vicious cycle. Yeah, that's what I always teach my patients is to use the breath to check in, not just to practice it each day, but to use it. Even just, I even have some of them set an alarm every hour. Just check in, see what your breath is doing, because it's this barometer that can tell you ahead of time you know, what's going to happen. You can prevent the full-blown panic attack if you notice that the anxiety is building throughout the day. Um, yeah, and if I can get myself to do that regularly, four or five, or if I have somebody who's dealing with anxiety, I say 10 to 15 times a day. If I have somebody who's just the average person or somebody dealing with depression, I'll say practice this four or five times a day. Whatever breathing routine yeah. is comfortable for you. Uh, part of that is because I want to develop that muscle memory and I want them to develop that muscle memory. Part of that muscle memory is taking some part of my conscious logical mind and always having it tuned into what am I feeling, right? So many of us have gotten cut off at the neck and we just stay with the thoughts and we push away all of the body sensations and the emotional, you know, the early warning signs of the emotional system. Yeah, we look like little bobbleheads. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. that's why the breath training ha- is functional at so many different levels. Yeah, absolutely. Well, is there a somebody that 
comes to mind a story of someone who's had really good effects with the EFT tapping? Most everyone has a good effect with the EFT tapping if they stick with it. The problem I think often with EFT is initially it can stir things up a bit more sometimes. And then if you back away at that point, it feels like a failure. But often that's just the point you kind of need to get through before it kind of recedes. Um, but let's see a story. Um, I just, I guess just the other day I was talking to someone who was just in a total panic because she had to go back to work um, after being off during the pandemic. And, you know, she lives with someone that's very uh, fragile and, and at risk for getting sick. And, you know, she was working with, I've heard this story actually so many times from so many people, we've all been tapping on it. You know, but they're in a, in a work situation where masks aren't required and she's terrified, you know, that other people aren't willing to wear the mask and she's terrified that she's going to get sick and then get that, give that to, you know, the person she's living with. And, and so it's just to recognize what we can only control, what we can control. So kind of just tapping through all those fears, right? Because in our, the story in our head is it's already happened, <laughs> And then she's already sick and then this other person is already sick and dying and, you know, and it's, she's all the way out so far in the future, whereas right here, right now, she is safe and right here, right now, she has the ability to take several steps. She can wear her own mask. She can ask other people to wear a mask. She can keep distance, right? She can keep washing her own hands. She can take, we have control over what we have control over, but when we just focus on what we don't, right, our whole nervous system goes off. So we just started tapping, this was over the phone because she was all anxious, you know, and just tapping on all that fear. And, and there's still a real fear there, it's real, but the stories around it and how far she jumped into the future and the helplessness that she felt, those are, those are not, those were the stories. I've had several people recently who um, at various levels have been saying they're not able to wear the mask. And when I inquire, what do they mean? Well, I'm, I just, I'm not getting enough air. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass yeah. out. I'm, and I understand that that's an emotional response. Yeah. Because surgeons wear these masks all the time. Right, right. And so I've suggested EFT tapping, and several people have been able to tap their way free and clear so that they can wear a mask now. Yeah, then, interesting. I haven't had anyone on the other side of the fence. Everyone I'm seeing is mad that other people aren't wearing it. But yeah, well, but absolutely. And even actually, I'll be honest, I myself have that response when I put the mask on. I feel like, I feel like I'm suffocating. And so I really have to just breathe and, and notice my body, notice I am breathing and I'm fine. Well, and um, most of us that have practiced that EFT tapping, what we've noticed, and this was something Gary Craig said right before he was taking his sabbatical there's a lot of people that get benefit just by remembering and visualizing tapping without even touching the tapping points because so much of it is with the breath and with the intention yes and so you know if i find myself in a store with the mask on and the glasses are getting fogged up and I can't really see much well without the glasses. <laughs> right so there I have to keep them on. I just take a breath or two and remember tapping. I don't need, I'm perfectly okay with tapping right out in public. If I'm, you know, if I'm in a situation where I get triggered, I don't care if people think I'm silly. I've been doing yeah. this long enough and teaching it long enough. But most of the time, I don't need to raise a hand to the different points on my face and the fingertips. I just remember it, visualize it, and breathe through it. Absolutely, because what we imagine is, is, affects our body just as if it's actually happening. But yes, I've been doing that too, because lots of people right now, um, especially I have some OCD patients who are afraid to touch their face. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. You don't need to touch your face. Just imagine it. Um, and, yeah. and, and then tap these other points so you can physically get in contact with your body a little bit. But yeah, just imagining it. Well, or when you're out in public, same thing. Um, you know, I think it's red bird flies, blue bird rises, whatever. There's one of these uh, acupuncture, acupressure system books. And they talk about how the terminal points 
for all of the energy meridians are right at the end of the finger on either right. side of the nail bed. Right. So I've been telling people for a lot of years now, the shortcut version is just I just start it. rubbing my fingers. I just, yeah. the whole finger, rub the end. I can, and I have people that are CEOs, they're executives in boardrooms, and they don't want people to know they're nervous that they have to, so they just, under the table, they're just rubbing their fingers or right out on top of the table. Yeah. A lot of people have nervous habits, and I'm just one at a time going through my fingers. They'll think I'm cracking my knuckles. And yeah, they, yeah. Got I knuckle. use that one a no. lot, actually. <laughs> so if, especially at this time where I don't want, you know, to coach people, go ahead and touch your face if you're in a store, visualizing or tup tapping or rubbing the fingertips or the fingers or the wrists, since these energy meridians run through the wrists and come up and the Ayurvedic pulse points are in the wrist. So I have people that just, they don't like the idea of, touching their face or so they put their hand in in the other hand and now they're wrapping around so the fingers are touching those pulse points and just yeah. gently rhythmically squeeze or just rubbing in the palm in of your hand of palm. is another one yeah yeah there's so many ways to and i tell um, people just find the one that works best for you exactly it's not a right or wrong thing it's your it's your energy system and what we're trying to do is help you explore it be aware Absolutely. that it's there because you've probably been trained to think it's not important, right? It's or it doesn't body. exist, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not the body. It's the, it's not the mind. The mind is the problem. The emotions are the problem. What's my body got to do with it? Yeah, my body. A lot of us yeah. have been trained to believe that. Yeah, absolutely. As though they're separate. Or we're so alarmed by the body. Every little signal is a threat, right? And so learning that they, they they're just off. there to give right. us information. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it kicks off the negative self-talk, and the negative self-talk is so common that we allow it. And it's just, it, most people don't realize how brutal their own negative self-talk is. That's another real important part of my work with people. Helping them interrupt that negative self-talk pattern and, rec and question it. Because, you know, a lot of times we haven't even, well, it's my own thought, it must be right. You know, it reminds me of one of my favorite bumper stickers, which is, don't believe everything you think. Or was it Mark Twain who said, it's a, you know, I don't like to travel around too long in, this, in my mind. <laughs> it's, it can be a dangerous place. Right, right. I want to go there unattended. Yeah. Well, and the idea that uh, you mentioned that the body doesn't know at a certain level, the difference between a thought I have about something or a fear I have about something happening and the actual event happening. Right. I mean, so we can just be sitting outside in the front lawn, just doing reading a book, and um, we can start thinking about all the things that might happen in the future, all the things that are going wrong in the world right now. There's certainly plenty to choose from. And if we can get caught up in all that, our body's responding as if, it's happening right here, right now. Or the woman who was afraid that she was going to get COVID, right? Her body was already responding as if. Or actually, I just saw a text on a Facebook post. Someone ended up in the hospital yesterday and was already, was you know, she thought she was going to die because she has COPD and she was convinced she had COVID and she was convinced that was the end. And in reality, she had, you know, bronchitis and she's fine. And But, but that just the sensation of the, tightness in her chest immediately, she had already jumped to that. And so her body was responding as if that was true and undoubtedly made the sensations so much stronger that it, you know, that it was confirming what she believed in her head yeah, and just it's, ended it's, up, and then she ended up in the ER over it. It's ancient <clears throat> wisdom. I remember years ago reading the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin where he said, I've experienced many horrible difficulties in my life most of which have never happened. Right, right. So right. It, that's the ancient wisdom about what our modern day science is letting us know. We talked about it in our first conversation that the muscles in my body light up if I visualize playing tennis as though I was actually playing tennis. Right, absolutely. Or if we're picturing sitting on a beach and can look, imagining seeing the sand and the water, visual parts of our brain light up. And if we're imagining hearing the waves, the auditory parts light up. 
all as if it's we're right there and it's happening. And so we can harness that power or we can, you know, right. become victims of it. Depending well, on that's, that's the idea of teaching these skills that you teach people is helping them harness that power. Right. You know, instead of calling it um, with kind of disdain, the placebo effect, Bruce Lipton recommends we call it the belief effect, right? right. The, the positive power of the mind to create productively. Right. I'm forever telling my patients the story of the, the two wolves. I think they get tired of my story of the two wolves. But nonetheless, right, the, the one where the grandfather is talking to his grandson and he's telling him about the two wolves, kind of that same idea of the, the angel and the devil. It, it, right. Um, but the two wolves are the good wolf and the bad wolf. And the good wolf is full of um, joy and love and hope. And the bad wolf is, is all the negative emotions, fear and hopelessness and um, terror anger and despair and, vengeance, and anger. Yeah. And the little boy's eyes get really big and he gets really, he's like, well, which wolf wins? And it's whichever wolf you feed. And that's the whole deal, right? It's whatever, whichever pathway we keep feeding, it just keeps getting stronger and stronger. Um, and that, that becomes our go-to pathway. So as soon as anything happens, that's instantly where we go because we've wired it. That's the path that's stronger. It's the, you know, it's the path we tread more often. Um, what fires together, wires together. So really, we have to, it's a matter of training and practice, daily practice to rewire that. So because of, implicitly our brain wants to go there, but, the negative bias, right? We, we need to know when there's danger and we don't need to remember, you know, the rainbows and the good things that happen. And so we really have to train the brain to, um, to shift that direction. Well, and um, awareness is so important here because, you know, you mentioned the idea of, for some people, to get into the breathing pattern or technique, they need to move a little. Yes. And it's a fairly common thing for me in um, therapy that we I watch as people are talking about something, and as they get to something where they're feeling shut down or overwhelmed, they'll they'll move. Yes. In a certain way, they'll drop the head the or body to the right or or tighten, and just pointing that out to them and getting them to change that. Physical positioning yes. is powerful for change. Can, oh, it can is. you say something about that? Yeah, well, there was one interesting study that was done in a, a psych inpatient unit where they had a group of people, um, one group of people were sitting up tall and one group of people were slouched and they gave them um, a bunch of words. Some of them were negative and some of them were positive. And afterwards, they had them recall the words. And the ones that were sitting tall recalled them pretty much equally. But the ones that were slouched over could only remember the negative words, right? So um, it influences you know, how, how we remember things, how we call things and how we see things. But um, one of my favorite stories about that with a patient was I, I had this woman come in and she, um, I was teaching her breathing and she just, she was, she, everything about her was everything had to be done now. Like it had to be perfect and it had to be happen now. Like she wanted to get fixed now, today, not tomorrow. She wanted to be everything to resolve today, even though she was, I think in her seventies and, and right. It, she'd been working on this for a long time, but, nothing ever worked because it had to be done right now. So there's all this pressure. So I started to teach her the breathing, but right, she was getting tenser and tenser because she's trying to do it just right, just right, which is just causing more and more tension. Um, but I noticed while she was doing it that she also had a perfect frown, right? Her, her, her lips were kind of turned down. So I just had her try to breathe while focusing on just turning up her lips just a little bit. And that slight smile shifted everything about her and she just found the softening the space and and her breath started to get full and um she she kind of just lit up for a moment but then she said so that's it we you know i just have to turn my lips up and i was like well it's not it but it it is simple right and it does change your whole physiology and it, and, and it had that effect imagine if you could do that more often in practice and she instantly got into her head and it wasn't what she wanted and it wasn't the solution she wanted and so she got back into her head and the frown came back on and instantly she was back in that other place again but it was really it was such a subtle subtle shift in the body and yet it had a huge profound impact on 
on her mood and her physiology and her everything about her in that moment. Even her muscles instantly softened. Well, and then they've done the studies with the, the pencils and the, you know, have them watch uh, a bunch of college kids watch the comedies and the ones that were gritting their pencils so that they had a frown, right? Didn't find it nearly as funny as the ones that had, were gritting the pencils so that they had a smile. They found it, you know. So our bodies are uh, powerful um, in how they influence how we perceive the world. Yeah, and there's this constant feedback loop, right? So that yeah. if I have this negative assessment of myself or the future going on, it's going to create the physiological response to go with it. And if I can change that to something just a little bit more positive, there is a corollary response in the body. Or you know, vice versa, change the body and cha- changes the thought a little that's bit. That's right. They're, they're right. connected. And right. so right. You know, there's a study that you were talking about studies or a study I remember reading in one of the books about this that they decided to see what a minor change in the filter, conscious, subconscious or unconscious, would have on someone's test performance. And so mm. they gave people a, a, an introductory letter saying, you know, you're coming in to take this standardized test. Yeah. Everybody's going to get a letter. They randomly assigned to two groups. One letter had just a kind of a, a neutral set of words as determined by some third party judges. Um, one had some negative kind of words and one had more positive kind of words. It was clearly beneficial in the results for the people who read the letter that was geared to positive. Yeah. We're yeah. glad you're here. You're going to have a great time. It's going to go well. This is a relatively easy test it, versus, you know, this is a very challenging test. You, you better brace yourself. Or those kind, just in the intro letter yeah. dramatically affected the test results. Yeah, there's another oh. study I love. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, the on the hotel maids with uh, Dr. Ellen Langer, and she again took two groups of women, all of whom were overweight and had some health problems, um, and she divided them into two groups. And one group um, just continued to go about their same daily cleaning, um, and the other group, though, she gave it a little intervention, and all she did was she. Well, she'd asked all the women ahead of time how much they thought they exercised, and none of them thought they did because as soon as they went home to work, they pretty much just collapsed on the couch right. um, and watched TV all night because they were exhausted. Right. Um, and so they all thought that they weren't getting exercise and they you know, were lazy and they had all these ideas about themselves back to the story. Um, so the intervention with the other group was she simply told them, hey, do you realize like you're getting Everything way you're doing, above yeah. and beyond what most Americans get for exercise? Like you're exercising all day long. Right. Re- and redefining just, what they're doing as exercise. Yeah. And just that small change in just two weeks, the study was just short, but they'd already dropped weight and their, their blood pressure dropped and their glucose levels dropped. And right, there were major shifts in just a really short period of time just by shifting their idea of what exercise was and wasn't and, how, and that they were getting it versus that they weren't. Right, which um, is coming back to the idea of what's the story I'm telling myself what's now. What's the story, yeah. And if I can get people to recognize that they're telling themselves a negative story and then just introduce the possibility that they're probably creative enough to put a little bit of a spin on it to make it a more positive or neutral story. Just watch what happens. Yeah. So that's right. an intervention I use with people. Yeah. She did another really cool study of the one, uh, I think it was filmed on, maybe it was, I don't remember, but um, where she took a bunch of older men and took them to a monastery. Are you aware of that study? No. Um, so she, um, they redid the monastery so that everything in the monastery was from a time about 25 years earlier. So all these men went back and they were supposed to live and act and speak as if it was this earlier point in time when they were younger and healthier. And so the magazines and the TV shows, everything that was in there was from this other time. Um, And again, they were just there for the weekend, three days. But in that time, 
like almost all their health parameters from lab work and saliva tests and everything else um, improved. improved. Yeah. And they, they actually looked and acted younger when they walked out of there than they had walking in. And obviously nothing changed except for their idea about what, e- you know, their age and, and what that meant and our ideas of aging. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a very powerful tool. And so getting us to recognize the role of the story we're telling or the filter we're putting on our mind um, and because most of us don't understand that that's happening, right? Yeah. We just think all this negative self-talk, I think it's uh, Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, talks about if you had a way to get a transcript of your negative self-talk and handed that transcript to one of your good friends and had them follow you around all day and read it to you, you'd kick them out of your life before noon. You wouldn't let anybody talk to you from the outside the way you talk to yourself on a regular basis. And a lot of my work with people is helping them see the error, the falseness of most of the negative thoughts they have about themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I do the I can, same thing when they're in the middle of it. I'll be like, would you, tell, would you ever tell your friend that if they were in the same situation? Would you ever say that? Would you ever even think it? Yeah, I routinely have to have people when I'm trying to coach them to modify. Just modify. I don't have to turn it around 180 degrees, but slightly modify or improve their negative self-talk. And they're very stuck. They're very, well, this is the truth. This is what I did. This is who I am. This is how I feel. So I'll ask them to think about what they would tell a favorite niece or nephew if they were going through the same thing or if they have a child that they really cherish, what they would tell their child if their child came. And that's a powerful way to flip the filter. Um, It isn't magic, but it is a powerful way for people to create a more, at least more accurate, if not even more positive self-talk pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And as you're demonstrating by these two examples that were done through research, the self-talk pattern has dramatic impact, not just for our emotional life, but for our physiology, which is Everything. never separate. Yeah. It is not separate. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a patient yesterday and she, um, she is, she had come to me initially because she had a hard time. She just, she hadn't left the house in in the longest time. She was afraid to leave. And, um, but she had, you know, we'd kind of worked through all that using EFT and EMDR and, and, and breathing and all this stuff. And, and, so she'd been fine for years, but now in the pandemic, she, now she doesn't have to go anywhere. So she kind of feels like she's afraid, although it hasn't actually happened, that when she has to go back out into the world, she won't be able to re-enter the world. Um, but her nephew is, is also has a lot of anxiety. And so she took him to the store the other day and she had to kind of talk to him and talk him through and be like, it's okay, it's okay to feel anxious and it's okay and we're just going to get through it and we're okay. And right, and so that's kind of what we worked on is just pretending her nephew was always with her and to kind of talk to him, talk to herself in the same way she was talking so um, gently and just being with him forced her, right? As, as parents and adults so often have to do, we have, you know, we put on kind of our braver self, our our adult self when we're with smaller, with people that aren't as brave or aren't as big or aren't as old. Um, And so just kind of to always imagine that, well, and what, what you're saying as, um, you know, a, a medical doctor and a psychiatrist is so powerful. I, I want to slow it down for people and, and amplify what you just said. You, as a psychiatrist and the author of the book, Healing Depression Without Medication, a psychiatrist's guide to balancing mind, body, and soul. You just said, we as adults often have to just talk ourselves through these things, right? You, as you sit there, are not devoid of negative thoughts or waves of anxiety. I wish. (laughs) Right? Well, but but here's the thing is, 
I, I, what's bringing this up is that I've I had a couple patients recently who said to me, I feel like a complete hypocrite because I was telling my daughter when she was sick in the middle of the night, it's going to be okay, you're going to be fine, and I'm rubbing her stomach, and I'm rubbing her back, and I'm telling her, and then I had to walk down the hall, or I had to go in the other room where I had to be on the phone with somebody else, and I'm in a panic as the parent, yeah. thinking, oh my God, what if she, and the whole cycle of what if we have to go to the hospital during the COVID-19 time, and, and then she, one was a, a female, the other was a male, and then they go back and deal with their kid, and they're putting on a brave face again, and they yeah. said, I feel horrible about it, and I said, you don't need to feel horrible about it, it's exactly what all of us have to do. Yeah. Nobody does this thing called life without the fear and the trepidation, the neutral times, the positive, it's all right. part of the experience. Yeah. And I often think, what I often talk with patients too is, right, we, we still have those little parts. We still have the five-year-old inside of us, right? A five-year-old is still um, pops up from time when we get scared, right? That is that five-year-old that's kind of popping up. I, I almost, right, to create a little space almost. Like, okay, that five-year-old needs to be tended to right? Even though I'm in this 50 something year old body, right? I still have the five year old that needs to be tended to in those moments. And so to tend to really, um, to tend to that child the same way you would your own child or your own pet or your own niece or your own nephew or whatever. Um, but, um, but that we all need that still, right? right? We never right. go out of that just because we're yeah. older. I, I just flashed on a time when my oldest was, I don't know, maybe maybe two and um and walking and and running <laughs> and he took a nosedive onto the pavement and split his lip and had particles of the pavement embedded in his lip and mm -hmm. i i almost threw up just watching that happen but in the yeah. next moment i realized i have to be the adult here and i have <laughs> to go and so then I'm with him in the emergency care room and they're saying, hold him down while we dig out the stuff from his lip and stitch and talk to him. And well, I have to fight off my horror and all the projection of what's it going to look like in the future. If his lip is mangled and whatever. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. What's he, you know, like I'm a psychologist at that point. So I'm thinking, uh Oh, what if he's staring at me as they're doing these horrible things and he imprints it's negative. Seeing all, my fear. Right? Yeah. all of that. I had to just breathe through that and put that aside. And none of us are immune to this. And that's, no. I just wanted to slow that down. When you said you're talking about this woman who got through it better because she was coaching her nephew about managing the anxiety in the store and, and how she can, if she chooses, Absolutely. if she remembers with your coaching to use that very same model, even when her nephew isn't there. Right. to talk gently, lovingly, and respectfully to herself the way she would a favored nephew or a, her own child. Yeah. And unfortunately, right, so many of us never learn that. And you can see that on the playground because you see kids fall and scrape their knees, not as seriously, right, as your son, but the minor ones. And you see on the playground different responses. So you see the parent that runs over and starts scolding the kid, right, out of their own fear. But, you know, stop crying, just shut up, just deal with it. You're fine. It's just a little scrape. You know, it's not a big deal. I told deal. you not to run. Right, right. It's all your fault. And so the child... Either when they're really small, they scream louder, and then over time they learn not to. They learn to ignore their emotions, to cut off from all of that, um, because it's not, you know, it's, you're not allowed to do that. And then there's a parent that comes over and it just starts barraging the child with questions. What's wrong? What happened? What, right? And the child just wants their, you know, scraped knee to be acknowledged, right? But the parent's trying to figure it all out, trying to ease their own anxiety through figuring out what happened. Um, and really all the child wants, then there's the third parent that goes over and just gives the child a quick little hug, a little, you know, kiss to the knee, and then the child goes off running again because the need has been met. And it's, and I think the work for all of us is learning to be that parent to ourselves. Right, right. And recognizing yeah. that we have each of those various versions of the memory of my five-year-old self or 15-year-old self or 20-year-old self 
that when it gets resonated, when it gets stirred up, it floods me in the moment. And instead Absolutely. of seeing myself as the competent psychologist in his own office, I feel like the traumatized teenager. Right, right. And as you're saying so often, if I can get grounded in the breath, bring my awareness back to the present moment, and then start basically telling myself the same thing I would tell my son or one of my patients or and being gentle with myself, right? Yeah. This, Sylvia Bornstein approach, you know, to, to put my hand over my heart space and talk gently to myself with a few breaths. Timmy, sweetheart, you're in pain. Take a few deep breaths. Calm down. Then we'll look at what's going on and then we'll decide what to do. But for now, Timmy, you're in pain. And yeah. that's the most important thing to interrupt that cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I realize we've um, pretty much covered almost an hour. Is there something you would like to... Uh, mention that we haven't mentioned yet? Just um, based on what you just are doing with your hands over the heart, right? I mean, research has shown that actually just doing that when we're scared actually releases oxytocin, right? That, that love hormone that helps us um, connect with others, but it also helps the body heal. Actually, it heals our heart cells. Um, it helps dilate our vessels. Um, so it's a powerful thing. It seems you know, like not much to do. And it's so simple to do. And you really, this is one thing you can do anytime, anywhere. Right? This right. doesn't look strange, um, but it, it really is a powerful tool just in and of itself. Right. It has the physical component, but it also brings my conscious awareness to that heart center. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing this time with us again. Um, I, be open to doing this again if you have another topic you'd like to share. And I greatly appreciate your being willing to share this time with us. Again, your book is Healing Depression Without Medication, A Psychiatrist's Guide to Balancing Mind, Body, and Soul. Jody Skillicorn. Um, the website you would direct people to if they wanted more information? JodySkillicorn.com. And uh, I have the Facebook page at Dr. Jody Skillicorn. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. And Thanks for having me. And our next contact. Okay, sounds good. Dr. Jody Skillicorn is board certified in psychiatry and neurology and a diplomat of the American Board of Holistic Integrative Medicine. After graduating Phi Beta Kappa from Skidmore College with a BA in English and working for nearly a decade as a photojournalist, she attended Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed her psychiatry residency at Northwest Northeast Ohio Medical University. Dr. Skillicorn is the author of the book, Healing Depression Without Medications, a psychiatrist's guide to balancing mind, body, and soul. At her private practice in Stowe, Iowa, Dr. Jody Skillicorn integrates conventional medical training with evidence-based holistic methods that include breathwork, meditation, yoga, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, known as EMDR, emotional freedom techniques, mind-body medicine, nutrition, exercise, and auricular acupuncture. Dr. Skillicorn believes strongly in the body's ability to heal itself if given resources and support, and the importance of empowering patients to take back their own health through simple but effective lifestyle changes. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 